years since I drew Katie Carter, Army Nurse. But you know, even after all these years, Army nurses walk up to me and say, hey, that was me. And even now, even today, when I hear them say that, I can sometimes get a little action. <laughs> Continuing now with Dick Martin, and uh, some people don't know, you directed uh, an enormous amount of New Heart episodes. Uh, yeah, you and Bob are, are buddies. Yes, and, uh, I've been for years. Uh, did a lot of Carol O'Connor's shows, and uh, all the way from Archie Bunker to uh, Heat of the Night. That's There's fun. a different ethic now among the younger comedians than there were among New Heart and Rickles, yourself. I mean, can you yeah. define that for us? Uh, I don't, I'm not sure what they're doing. Um, uh, I've seen these guys come out and, and just say, hi there, where are you from? Uh-huh, uh, I've never been there. And he does 10 minutes on that, and I'd say, what, what, what is he saying? Uh, I don't know. And then they talk about drugs and sex and... And, uh, and they uh, go home. Yeah, I, I don't understand it. We went in once to uh, the comedy store and watched 12 comics, Steve Lawrence and Sal Ilson and I. They were, they were going to star Steve Lawrence in a show. And we were looking for a gang like we had. Yeah. We saw 12 comics and didn't see one funny person. Do you think a lot it's a, of them said funny things? That's a different thing. Right. It is a different a thing. A different thing. I mean, you can write clever material people. for anybody, that's and if right. they're an actor, they can deliver it. They can say it. Yeah. But if, do you think it's a discipline? Though? I mean, it took you and Rowan a long time to get to the laugh-in situation. I mean, you got to play all. Well, there's a difference in what we played too. We played hotels, for instance, where uh, the people did not necessarily come in to see a show. They are staying there, so they come down to dinner. And incidentally, there's a show, so you've got to entertain these people. And there's a, a, a dance team and you and a girl singer. Uh, but these people, the kids today, they go into a comedy store, and the people come in to hear co comedians, and they're all the same. Yeah, they're pretty much derivative of the people Very who much. have made it. Do you see any younger talent, I ask this to Phyllis Diller, who make you laugh, engage you? Robin Williams, yeah. Oh, I, love, I love free uh, uh, the people who just... Um, have f uh, free wheel, and, and Robin is excellent at it. And where I knew he was, I saw him a, f a lot of times, but he went to London and was at the Palladium Theater and went in amongst them and, and, and was doing that. Now, these people are not the same. As Americans. Uh, no, it's right. different. He got them, and, and it was just, he, he just a marvelous talent. That's the Jonathan Winters school of absolutely, improv. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, did you guys do a lot of improv on Laugh-In? 90% of it. Oh, not on Laugh-In. Laugh-In, it was, we had 13 of the greatest writers in the world. Uh, but uh, we came from uh, nightclubs where uh, it was almost impossible. Was, as you know, we, we had some great writers. Right. Couldn't write a word for us. Mm -hmm. Because we did something different in clubs. Right, it, you were it, playing off your, your, each other exactly. and the audience. It was, uh, uh, Joey Bishop once said it's like uh, two, two people in one mouth. They said we knew each other. You've been out here for a long time. Is Hollywood a funny place? I mean, we've been trying to get a feel on this for the rest of the country I who doesn't live here. Is this a funny so. place? No, no, it's funnier than, than Peoria, but it's not really funny. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's so uh, dissected. And, and, and spread out, that because I live in Malibu and Bel Air, and uh, uh, I don't see anyone. They think that everyone sees everybody every day. I don't see people for a year. No, no cocktails no, with uh, no. this one and that no. one? And oh, I see Newhart a lot. I see yeah. Tim Conway, a certain group. Right. Uh, all the time. But you're pretty isolated in your own little pretty world. Pretty much. But let me tell you, uh, Mr. Martin, uh, living in Malibu and uh, Bel Air, not bad. No, no, You know no, what I mean? No, no, not no, bad. No. Sock it to me, you <laughs> bet your bippy, paid off That's big. That's true. Right. That's uh, true. Anyway. Anyone can walk up to me and say, say good night, Dick, anytime. Anytime they want. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Mr. Martin. Hey, it's a pleasure, pleasure to have you in here, and I, uh, I really admire your work. Thank, thank you, you very much. And that's it for us today. As always, we thank you for watching. I'm Bill O'Reilly, reporting from Los Angeles. Hope to see you again next time. Stand by for news, observation, and opinion. Coming up today from Los Angeles, child prostitutes selling themselves on the streets of America. One California woman is waging her own personal war against that. Plastic surgery for men. It's big business in L.A. 
the secrets of success. They are different here in California. And we'll also talk with showbiz icons Phyllis Diller and Laffin's Dick Martin. Those stories and more on the O'Reilly Report right now. Hi, I'm Bill O'Reilly reporting from Los Angeles. Thank you for watching us today. One of the things we are trying to do out here is talk with celebrities who have made a lasting impression on Americans. Along with Lucille Ball, Phyllis Diller paved the way for female comedians on television. Now at age 80, she is still performing. We'll get the latest from Miss Diller. And millions of Americans remember Laugh-In as the groundbreaking program it was. For five years, Dan Rowan and Dick Martin broke all the rules and ruled television. A little later on, Mr. Martin will join us. But first, the lead story. There is a war going on here in Los Angeles, a battle for the minds and bodies of runaway children. On one side are violent pimps who exploit lonely, vulnerable kids. On the other side is a woman who is trying to save these children. Some Fox facts. Each year, two million American children run away from home, and hundreds of thousands of them head for Los Angeles. It is estimated that up to 300,000 minors are involved in prostitution in the USA. And in Los Angeles, an organization called Children of the Night has helped at least 10,000 runaway kids, many of whom were involved in the sex industry. With us now is Dr. Lois Lee, the founder of Children of the Night. You work with a very specific type of child that child is caught up in pornography or prostitution is on the street. Why did you select this group and not other kids who are running around? Oh, I was a radical. I started by suing the police for not arresting an equal number of men and got involved in meeting prostitutes on the streets and they said it's really too late for you to help us but do something about kids. I didn't want to help kids. I was going to teach college, write a book on prostitution, spend my summers in Europe and I just got caught up. I found these kids. I'd put them in shelters. The directors would say they can't stay here. They're whores. They've got pimps. They'll jeopardize the other children. And they literally were put back on the streets by the government supported programs. The Department of Children's Services said they're not victims. We don't care. They're prostitutes. It's illegal. The judges said they're not crimes against property. We're not even going to put them in juvenile hall. All right. So what, what I'm getting is these kids were falling through the cracks. Absolutely. If they had been violent offenders, the system would have dealt with them. If they had just been uh, kids with, with little problems you would have recycled them back to their homes but here you have kids out on the street breaking the law but considered you know not a danger to society absolutely all right in my estimation this problem you've been at it since 1979 is not getting any better I no. mean, we're always going to have abusive homes and that's where most uh, kids who get caught up in the sex industry come from abusive homes uh, the government can't control the drug problem it's obvious they don't know what to do and children are running away millions of them every year so it doesn't seem to be any solution to this problem yet your program has helped 10,000 of these kids. Yes. How do you do it? I do it because we provide t total care. If a child, once a child calls Children of the Night, they're in the program, whether they need to go back to the streets or they need to stay on the streets for a little while. It's 100% total unconditional love, and we're with them through the entire process of building the trust relationship to get them off the streets. All right, let's be specific about it. The child goes to your shelter. No, a child, first of all, may reach our, see our outreach team on the streets, hands them a plastic card with a hotline number on it child calls the hotline during a crisis situation and we say do you want to come in or do you want other services if they want to come in we stay on the phone with the child until a cab reaches the child the taxi cab brings them into the shelter they come in they get a new set of clothes they get hygiene items they go on the program immediately which is seven o'clock wake up seven thirty jazz class breakfast showers life planning where you can go to a foster home a group home a maternity home, a drug program, a mental health facility, or do our independent living program. All right, now you're talking so fast that everybody's writing down notes here. <laughs> what I'm getting is you have an organized uh, plan to Structured get the kid plan. off the street once they call your number. Then you, they come into the home, you give them structure yes. right away. And right? they have a school. We have our own have school. school. They have to obey the rules. They have to do what you tell them to do. If not, they're expelled from the home? No. Uh, how do you handle kids who say, hey, I'm not going to get up at 7 o'clock in the morning. I'm gonna well, do then you you're want. not ready for our program, but we can put you in another shelter where you can sleep in a dorm and hang out in Hollywood Boulevard in the afternoon. And when you're ready, come back. But if someone rapes you or beats you up, here's a hotline number. You call. I'll help you. 
Okay, so you, I guess you do have to expel some kids we to... We don't expel them. I mean, no, but really I mean move them out to other facilities. No, it's really their option. We have a reputation among children on the streets throughout this country that if you went off the streets, you go to Children of the Night, they'll get you off the streets. Now, if you're not ready for it, it's okay. It's not like you're expelled or you're bad. Mm -hmm. You can still call and use all our other services. The reality is, is that they do come back because we do everything for them. Right, and I mean, you're giving them a, an environment where they feel safe. You're, you're taking them away from the pimps and the... Uh, garbage that well, are exploiting them. We're also showing them. them how to mainstream into the larger society. That they don't just because you had this incident, you were sexually abused by your parents since you were, say, three years of age, just because, you know, you were in, on the streets, turned a few tricks for six months, doesn't mean that that's who you are for the rest of your life. And we can help mainstream you. We can get you in colleges. We can help you get into professional schools. We can get you in the entertainment industry. That doesn't mean come to children no, that you be a movie What percentage star. Of, the, of the children do you think you get through to? We know we get through to 80% of the kids. 80%? 80% that's, of that's the children. amazing. Uh, but it's am not something that happens in 90 days or because of step one, step two, step three. We are their parents. We are their family. The kids refer to us. So you stay with them for a long time? Forever. I have Forever. kids that are 35 years of age, and I still and have them in And you big files, and you, and you keep track of them, and, and this and that. Yes. Now, to do this takes money. Yes. You've had some celebrities. Uh, this Tracy Lords is actress who used to be a porn star. Was she a runaway kid, by the way? Did she? She was a runaway, sexually exploited child. All right. Who so Hollywood she was seen the whole system. Eat it again right. and again. Yes. Now she has helped you. Oh, she's been very involved in Children of the Night. She brought Roseanne to Children of the Night organization, and today, even when she works in movies, she insists that the Children of the Night children are used as extras in the movie. All right, good for her. And Roseanne gives you money and gives support. Gives us money. And Roseanne publicity. spent almost every Saturday in our shelter when she was pregnant with our right. kids, and the kids are going to her taping. And it's she's too bad Boulevard. more celebrities don't help you out, though. You know That's what I mean? That's true. It's because, very true. I mean, it's right down the street, Hollywood Boulevard, right down the street from Bel Air and Beverly Hills, where yes. these people live in million dollar mansions. You get these poor kids. And, you know, Los Angeles is a seductive place. It's warm out here. People come here. Uh, they, they hope to do something. And these pimps are all over the place, you know? My, well, my patience see, level with them is not a lot. Right. And you're going to see a return of upper middle class and rich kids back to prostitution like they were involved in the 70s because heroin is the drug of the 90s. Kids are smoking it. We've documented heroin use uh, in three major exclusive private schools so here in Los Angeles. So heroin's a big problem, One and, of the girls and, a, and the government has no clue at all. We only have about 45 seconds left. I want you to give the 1-800 number uh, for people who would like to help you out and for kids who might need your services. So. Yes, the number's good, 24 hours, 7 days a week. Please call 1-800-551-1300. Okay, 1-800-551-1300, Children of the Night. And uh, they can use help from you, and they could also help a child who may be watching this broadcast who is uh, involved in the sex and industry. And we get no money from the government. It's all done No, I know. It's private. You do great help. work, and that's the reason you're our lead story today on the program. Oh, thank you. Thank you, doctor, very much for talking with us today. Thank you. All right. And there is plenty more to come as we move along. Men having cosmetic surgery. It's big business here in L.A. Also, we'll talk with Phyllis Diller and Dick Martin. But up next, the psychology of living in the nation's most glamorous city. The L.A. lifestyle is different than anywhere else in America. And we'll have that report when we come right back. Fox News Team Washington. The issues, the players, the inside stories. We'll help you understand, giving you the facts fairly, balancing the issues without taking sides. Fox News Team Washington is there with an eye on the Capitol, keeping politics in sight, focusing on what's really going on. Fox News Team Washington. Well, I've been covering Washington for 27 years. It's all about power most of the time. The intention here is to do broadcasts that people can trust. Britt Hume and a team of Carl experience. Cameron, Wendell Kohler, Tony Snow, Respected, Jim Angle, Fred Barnes, Rita Cosby, Aggressive, Steve Santani, David Schuster. Thorough correspondents put the issues in perspective. Fox News Team Washington. Policies, pundits, and politics. Who's winning, who's losing, and who's just playing games. It's our money, our issues, and our country. Fox News Team Washington. Your team on the Hill, America's team in Washington. In the Impact segment today, the reality of living in L.A. No question, this is the most glamorous city in the world. The movie industry makes it so. But along with all the glamour comes pressure. Pressure to look good, pressure to succeed, and pressure to impress. 
Many Americans think L.A. is a laid-back place, but we found quite the opposite. With us now is Dr. Robert Butterworth, a clinical psychologist who knows the mindset of L.A. very well. Being from the East Coast, I love to come out here, and the first thing that I always see are all the luxury cars. And I'm going, are people making that much money in this town? I mean, there's a Mercedes every 20 yards. What is that car thing? <laughs> you can lease anything in LA. I mean, you can also rent them for the day. If you're gonna go see somebody and you wanna make an impression, you go down to the corner, leave the old jalopy down the street, get that new car and drive in and really look in style. But you know, that's the whole, that's the whole sense of this place. We're all about fantasy, aren't we? This is where they make the movies. So people get caught up in the fantasy life and then they feel that they have to live it. They have to have the Mercedes, they have to and pretend they're important and live up to uh, an image that they have for themselves. It's all, in a lot of cases, that's all what counts. Remember, we're kind of a place that we don't have roots. We, most of us don't live here and didn't come here and we haven't been here a long time. All right, so they were born other places in America, have migrated out here. Now, to live up to that kind of a, an image is a lot of stress. I mean, everybody says, oh, laid back California. I, these people are kind of nervous, it seems to me. I'm generalizing. Hey, it's a lot of work to look laid back. I mean, you got to get the <laughs> tan and the hair and the, and the, and the, the relaxed look is a lot of work. Yeah. And to actually look like you're not having stress while you're having stress, that's a trick. Now, in America, people have bonds. They bond with their neighbors, hometown, uh, sometimes states like Texas, very strong pride. Do you see that in Los Angeles? Where, where is the pride centered around here? Well, first of all, we don't have neighborhoods, traditional neighborhoods like the rest of the country. I mean, we're all kind of, you know, we're like a city that was like this and they just kind of flattened it out. We're not talking about the earthquake now. We're just talking about flattened out neighborhoods. Nobody has any kind of sense of identity. So people just got here, people are leaving. So you don't really have a sense of who you are and where you came from. So you can be anybody, do anything you want, and a lot of times get away with it. Okay, so there's an anonymity. Do people bond with their neighbors or do they have strong relationships uh, on their street, things like you know, middle America has? You talk to people, when's the last time you talked to your neighbor? Oh, we had that earthquake about two years ago. Oh, remember the riots? We were out talking, but no, they don't. They really. <laughs> what, do they, what do people do though? What do they do with their time? Oh, we go to movies, there's so many things going on, okay, but so it's not, not with the same people in the same neighborhood. That's a place where you just sleep and wake up and just go off. What I'm getting from you, doctor, is that LA is a lonely place if you're not really ingrained in the system out here. You're making movies or TV. Well, or you're not so supposed kind of lonely to tell place. anybody that. Because but is it we're true? Also, oh, of course. Yeah. And uh, it's not only lonely, but if you don't make it or if you haven't made it, you're really isolated. I mean, you don't really feel like you belong. And people worship success, huh? And if, if you're not successful, it doesn't matter where you came from or who you are. If you're not successful, you're ignored. Yeah, but people are successful in different ways. I mean, you can be a very good person, and that's being successful. Is that respected out here? I hate to say it's not, but in some places it really isn't what really counts. It's what, what you do and what you've made of yourself, not who you are. And, and that's sad, but yeah. it's, it's the reality. This place is so huge, 500 square miles, and it, it's comprised of so many different kinds of people that it almost has to be that way. I was shocked when the L.A. Rams and the Raiders moved out. Nobody cared. Yeah. I mean, in Baltimore, when the Colts moved out, we're talking pro football now, <laughs> there were riots. I mean, people were, they had to go in the middle of the night. They feared the population. Well, I mean, so they don't have that bond with the city or civic pride. It's not here? Not to the extent the rest of the country. First of all, civic, what's civic? Where's the city hall? Well, city hall is way down there. Most people have never been downtown. People are kind of afraid to go downtown. Yeah, I know. It's kind of spooky down there. So it's not really a place we go <laughs> by or we even identify with. You know, so the fact that we're all spread out, the fact that we're not identified with people, and the fact that we're all either going up or coming down. Why are so many people moving here? This is going to be the largest city in the country by the middle of the next century. It's the second largest city now. Why do people, some, besides the gorgeous weather, it's just phenomenal. Why do, why do they move here? The city of dreams, the city of hopes. If you could come here as a, as a whatever and, and just make it, you can become a superstar. You can be noticed. You can, this is the place to be if you really want to make it. Yeah, if you want to gamble and then roll that dice, at one in 10 million, you could get it. But you don't see the poor people that don't make it, those folks with their tails between their legs that are just kind of creeping back quietly saying, well, you know, I tried, you know, all the waiters and the waitresses and yeah. all the people that are trying hey, to Hey, nothing make wrong it. with that. Give it your best shot, doesn't work out, they shouldn't feel bad. Hey, it's better to have that. tried right. than not tried Okay, at all. Doc, thanks very much for coming in. Take care. And directly ahead, a continuation of what we've been talking about, men getting cosmetic surgery. You won't believe what some of the guys out here are doing. That report, right after these announcements.
In the Unresolved Problems segment today, the way we look. We are used to hearing about women having plastic surgery. Many stars like Dolly Parton, Pamela Anderson, and Elizabeth Taylor have gone under the knife. But men are starting to alter their appearances as well, especially here in California. Some Fox facts. California has more certified plastic surgeons than any other state, 644. The next closest is New York with 398. The most commonly requested cosmetic surgeries are facelifts, nose jobs, and breast enlargements. And more than 400,000 Americans underwent cosmetic surgery in 1996. Mostly those were women, but the men are starting to catch up. And we're talking real men, too, like Sylvester Stallone. With us now is plastic surgeon Dr. Richard Ellenbogen and one of his clients, 51-year-old businessman Dan Tolkien. Let's start with you, Dan. I mean, what did you have done here? Well, I had some liposuction done around my back and my hips. And I had this, um, what do we call this in here? It's a, it's a neck operation. Neck operation. Oh, you had a little uh, turkey thing well, going on there? A lot there? of a turkey thing. All right, so you had the liposuction. They took some uh, fat off your, off your hips and stomach. Right. Why didn't you just do the sit-ups, Dan? I was a bull rider for most of my life. I've been an athlete most of my life. Yeah. I have been uh, physical fit for my Yeah, you look life. like you're in pretty good shape. Great, can't lose it. Diet, couldn't, couldn't lose couldn't it. Couldn't get rid of that roll, huh? Nothing. What do, what do you care? Well, I'll tell you. I'm in a business that majority of the people in my business are between 35 and 40 years old. Then it goes from 60 to 75. Well, those guys are now leaving. I've been in it for about 20 years now, and you have to look a little bit better than I looked before to be accepted by all really? the younger guys. I mean, these guys won't accept you if, you don't, if you're a little overweight or it's something, you got a little double chin here? It wasn't here? the overweight so much, but this was quite extreme. Yeah, and they were going, I'm not buying your stuff, Dan. You got a little neck thing going on. Basically. That wouldn't happen in Cleveland. You know no, I, mean? I know that. I've okay. been there. But basically, basically, you have to appeal to their, their basic uh, looks. Yeah, I guess, I guess. I mean, if you want to make the money. All right, Doc, let's go over to you. You're the uh, cutter here. You're the guy doing the surgery. You've done some movie stars. Um, Lana Turner, did you do? Yes, many years ago. Yeah, you, you shaped yes. Lana up for a while and Sally Kirkland yes. and uh, a few other people. Yes. Now, I understand the movie star business because as Dixie Carter once put it on this program, you have to look four years old in the, in the movie business. But now, guys like Dan, he's kind of a macho guy, rides the, bu the bulls and all of this coming in. Is that more common? Are we getting more guys coming in? It's, it's quite interesting. It, for the last, I've been a plastic surgeon 21 years out here in California. I've always had about 20% of my patients were men, but now the men are starting to admit that they had plastic surgery. Ah. It really hasn't changed in numbers. Really? Then again, there are more operations to do on men now. The hair transplant operations have gotten better. Uh, certainly liposuction is, is uh, I disagree with those, those findings. Liposuction is probably the most commonly asked for operation in the United States. And by men? By men, I mean, yes. you got to understand the breast enlargement thing. <laughs> Humongous. I mean, men don't need that, right, Doc? No, but I, <laughs> by liposuction, I actually make the breast smaller, smaller in certain men. So men are getting the little lipo thing in, they're, but I don't understand. I do a lot of sit-ups, okay? And, I, you know, I don't need the lipo yet, but who knows? I mean, why don't they just do the sit-ups? What are they coming it, to you for? It just doesn't go away. I've worked no? on uh, world-class bodybuilders who, uh, who have 10% body fat, and in certain places the fat, fat just won't go away. Uh, another thing uh, very interestingly now that men are having done is laser resurfacing, particularly with a, something new called the uh, Erbium Crystal Laser by SEO. Uh, it takes about 10 days for the lasering to get done. It gets rid of the wrinkles in the face. So uh, facelift with a laser is what you're really doing. Well, facelift is one operation. That gets rid of the sags and bags. Dan didn't have a facelift. He had an operation which we do, particularly in men, just under the, just under the neck. There's no lifting up of the face. It's, it's unique to, to men themselves. Uh, the beauty of this new type of laser, however, is with the CO2 laser, uh, it takes about three months to heal. Men can't shave. With this new one, it heals in about seven to ten days. So, uh, so everybody can, can look like they're 19. I, you know, I like Clint Eastwood because he's aged, and, and I, the guy's got the wrinkle. I, kinda, I think that's kind of macho, Sean Connery. I don't like the Sylvester Stallone look. I mean, if this guy, if, if he sneezes, I'm afraid something's going to happen. You know what I mean? I mean, he's tight, too tight. Um, you look good, though, Dan. I mean, did you tell all your friends? You say, hey, uh, you know, I had this little deal done. and Actually, I said uh, nothing to them. They came out and said, boy, you shaved your mustache off. If you saw the pictures before yeah, well, and after. You're looking better. Did you take a vacation? That's that kind exactly of thing? right. You, you married? To them? No, I'm not married. Are you a girlfriend or anything? I've got a girlfriend. Yeah, what the girlfriend say? Well, she liked it a lot. She happens to be a stunt woman in the movies for 20 years also. So she said the liposuction's okay with her, yeah? She liked it, yeah. and um, she came back and I she gotta did tell something. you, Dan, if you were from my neighborhood in New York, we'd be razzing you. You know what I mean? We'd, well, be, we'd be giving you a little... Uh, 
I a do, little needle now. I now. do a lot of business in New York. <laughs> <laughs> all right, now, is this a coming thing, Doc? Are we all going to be looking like we're 17 when we're 65? Is that what's going to happen no, here in America? It's, because the technology is amazing. Well, it's not for everybody. You know, it's a choice that certain people have to look better, to feel better about themselves. Out of maybe five people that come in my office and they ask for certain aging surgery, I might turn down one or two of them because what they're asking me to do for them uh, won't help them in what they want. It won't bring back a, a, a lost lover. It won't get them uh, a better business. But what it will, does do, it gives somebody a better feeling about themselves so they can uh, basically, I, it was funny, I had a patient the other day, she says, I've been having a bad hair day, but I've also been having a bad face day. Uh, it gives somebody a good face day. It makes them feel good about themselves. When you feel good about yourself, your self-image is strong, you can do almost anything. Well, I agree with that. Psychologically, I mean, it enhances um, everybody's opinion of themselves to look the best they can. The, what I have a problem with, though, is society almost demanding that you be someone who you aren't. And, and I have trouble with that. I mean, if, as I said, if you're aging and you don't look as good as you once did 20 years, so what? I mean, somebody not going to buy Dan's product because he doesn't, because he's got a little double chin. Hey, I think the guy's a geek. I'll tell you, Dan, I wouldn't do business with the guy anyway. I just, well, I'd go around. To. Yeah, I mean, I say, hey, you know, hit the road, pal. Um, but on the other hand, um, I understand the obsession with youth, but I, I don't think I'm buying into it's, it. It's not really an obsession. It's interesting. In Japan, uh, when people get older, they're revered. And I have a friend who's a, a Japanese plastic surgeon. And I said, boy, you know, you probably don't do any facelifts. He says, don't, don't, you, don't you believe it? He does twice as many facelifts in Japan as I do. It's a natural thing for women to want to stay looking young, uh, regardless of what their society uh, or their culture, in that case, dictates. Uh, it's one of the, th I'm a choice, you know, I'm one of the things that people can do right. if, they, if they want it. It's not necessary, it's not for everybody, but for the right person it really does well, work. Well, technologically it's amazing and in 10 years, I mean, we're all going to look like Moosey Dreyer. Remember him on Laughing? We're going to talk about him later. Okay, thanks guys, I appreciate you coming in, Thank good you. luck. And still to come as we continue from Los Angeles, a woman who admits to having plastic surgery and also admits to making people laugh. Phyllis Diller will be here at 80 years old, she's still kicking. Back with Miss Diller in just a few moments. Fox News Now, I'm Katherine Cryer. A former paratrooper who killed a black couple as part of his initiation into a skinhead group will spend the rest of his life behind bars. A Superior Court judge imposed the sentence today after a North Carolina jury deadlocked 11 to 1 in favor of the death penalty. Three strikes laws mandating long prison terms for three crime criminals apparently haven't reduced crime. That's according to the Justice Policy Institute, which found the crime rate dropped more in states without the law. The group says it's still too early to conclude if the legislation works. Members of a House panel today sent a message to both President Clinton and Mexico. Their partnership in the war against drugs isn't working. The committee decertified Mexico as a full partner, reversing Clinton's earlier approval. Secretary of State Madeleine Albright said the move is premature. President Zedillo is also not denying the problem. He is uh, working to revamp his whole system. I think that we basically are denying him the ability to work through the problem if we create a backlash. A full House vote on the measure is scheduled for next week. A bill introduced in Congress today would force states to reduce legal intoxication limits or lose federal highway funding. Mothers Against Drunk Driving is backing the bill. The group says lowering the standard for blood alcohol levels from 0.10 to 0.08 would save 600 lives a year. And while doctors are telling people who want to watch their cholesterol to eat right, drug companies are taking a different tact. They're trying to convince Americans that products like Zocar, Mevacar, and Provacol can lower cholesterol and save lives. Their message seems to be getting through. Sales of those products have reached $3 billion. I'm Catherine Cryer. Coming up next, the O'Reilly Report continues. And join me at 8 Eastern for the Cryer Report and a look at the controversial domestic violence and gun control propositions.
One of the most interesting things about being here in Los Angeles is having access to famous people. The problem is many celebrities really don't have a lot to say, but there are exceptions. Stars who have made indelible impressions on Americans and are willing to talk about it. Is there anyone who doesn't know Phyllis Diller? Her career has spanned 42 years and she is perhaps best known for her appearances with Bob Hope. Phyllis Diller is certainly a pioneer in women's comedy and she joins us now. You've had a, a really interesting life. You didn't get into this racket until you were like 37 years old. You're sure. already a housewife raising kids. And you did the Groucho Marx, you bet your life, and then boom. Well, <laughs> you see, it made it easier because I had something to bitch about. You had something to complain about, your well, kids right. and your, your husband, right. Fang. And I, I remember I, this like it was yesterday. You know, uh, I was growing I, up with you. And, and I feel sorry for young, 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 young comics who, you know, who wants to hear about homework? Yeah, but in your day, you were one of the, you and Lucille Ball really defined female comedy. Would you well, say? Well, there's a great distinction there. Uh, fe uh, Lucille was a comic actress, and you were stand-up. And it's such a difference. But one on, works ensemble, one works alone. But on television, and, and I'm sure you know this, yes. you were the guys making people laugh. Oh, you too. Oh yes. You yes, know, yes, and yes, then yes. it opened up, and then people. Well, she, came she in. was. See, she's the pretty, pretty, cutie, pretty, darling, pretty. Lady comic, right? And you it were the. It to be ugly to be a stand-up. Oh, you weren't ugly, but, but hey, had, you know, what would you think of our plastic surgery? The hey, guy in here and all wasn't that. Wasn't he wonderful? <laughs> <laughs> How many times have you been under the knife there? I lost track. Yeah, it was. Uh, do they send you bills now, or is it uh, pro bono? Honey, they follow <laughs> me around with knives. <laughs> they want to work on me. I mean, you look great for 80 years old. So it's whatever wonderful. You, yeah, whatever you did is uh, is terrific. They, yeah. they, a lot of them. I've outlived several of them. Bob Hope. And you, yes. institutions. Do you still keep in touch with him? Oh, yes, yes. We have dinner a lot. Do you really? Yes. And what do you guys talk about? What would a Bob Hope and a Phyllis Diller chat about? Oh, things that happen. And, well, mainly his wife's career right now. His wife's career? My dear, she's gone back to having a career. She's working Rainbow and Stars in New York. Mm -hmm. And uh, with, with Rosie Clooney, and she's got about a fourth album out. She, uh, she goes to the studio and just cuts them like... Uh, crazy and you know she's almost as old as he is she's 87 so you guys talk about her career and then you reminisce about the good times that you had oh yes and some of the bad well, times that and we, we eat we eat we eat a lot oh you eat a lot bob has always been devoted to food yeah is he picking and up I, the tab for you there uh, he, yeah he's very generous right. yes now the stand-up comedy it's dirty today you know most comics Filthy. yeah and women comics too i mean you know this, does that offend you sometimes i i laugh at it and sometimes i squirm do you, do you think it's wrong? I mean, do you... Oh, I don't know. Sometimes, it, it, if it gets icky, slimy, you know... It's gyno, uh, gynecological? Well, if that... it gets gynecological, it kind of loses me. Right. But do you think you have to do that? No, days? I don't do it. No, I know. You, you I still know. work. You do the, yeah. the saloons and the yes, gambling palaces. Yes, and I, yes, I But do. see, you're accepted. Well, People I... are going to like you no matter what. You get up there and just, you know, hum, and they're going to like you. Well, they come want on. they want the real thing. But I'm sort of pre-sold. That's nice. But right. see, I come out looking like a maniac, and they're used to that, and <laughs> that gets them, gets them started, and then we just go from there. Would you ever do the dirty stuff? Never. No, you wouldn't do it. Why well, wouldn't you do it? Because you'd, you'd have to know my mother. <laughs> it goes back to your mom. My darling. Mm -hmm. If you are brought up by my mother, you're never going to do dirty stuff. What do you watch on TV? What makes you laugh? I love Fraser and Seinfeld. Those are my two favorite shows. And what is good about them And to I you? watch Leno, Jay Leno at night, because mm -hmm. his monologue is so polished and so good. Mm -hmm. Do you think he, do you miss Carson? Oh, yes, because, you know, I saw you with uh, Ed, McMahon. Uh, Ed McMahon yesterday, yeah. and, of course, uh, Carson was the master, the master, and it's it's too bad when you see someone and you say, well, he's working. It should look easy. Right, right. I, I miss Carson. I, I think the other, I like Leno and Letterman. Oh, yeah. I think they're extraordinarily well, talented, but they're frenetic. They're well, trying besides, so hard. But, but think about this. When Carson did the monologue, he did the monologue, and, the, and they laughed. Now, it's like... There's, it's like brum bum after every line. Right, right. And if you and, don't and laugh, guys that, are going to come to the to well, the stands well, no, and beat the, you up. The audience goes and the band goes. And see, that's to me back to burlesque, brum bum. Yeah. Like that means, I would like it to stand on the lines. Right. Without the brum bum. I, I agree, and especially late at night. I mean, I, I know it wakes me up. I just want to, I just want to <laughs> relax here. I, all right. Now I want to talk. We only have about a minute to go. You have an art career going here. Talk about a second career. Oh, you're yes. you're doing the paintings. We got a couple of. We want to show. I wish and what you do you would. do with these paintings now? Well, I have art shows. I'm getting ready for my seventh art show. A, a strange place, Wichita, Kansas. 
a, a very chic restaurant is going to hang it in their restaurant Good. as decor and for sale. Mm -hmm. And I will go there and have an opening. But hello. you do most of the, you give most of the money to charity. Do you? No, I don't. I oh, keep you keep it. it. I keep it. Well, good for you. Yes. So I mean. See, I'm honest. <laughs> and you're having a show in Vegas at MGM, MGM and Art Show? Grand, yes. I, I can't remember the date. Not too long from It's now. in April sometime. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> hey, listen, for 80 years old, I got to admire you. I'll be long gone by 80, but you look great. No, you you're won't. still with it. You're and, looking uh, fine. We appreciate you coming in. Thanks Thank you. very much, Ms. Dills. Pleasure to meet you. And just ahead, Dick Martin will join us and we'll talk to a woman who had to pay enormous college tuition costs at Brown University. You will not believe how she did that. Back with that report right after these messages. In the back of the book segment today, a book that's being turned into a TV movie and a book that has raised more than a few studied eyebrows in the world of Ivy League education. Heidi Matson was valedictorian of her high school class in Maine. She was then accepted into Brown University, one of the most expensive colleges in America. One problem, Heidi had to figure out a way to pay the tuition. The name of Heidi's book is The Ivy League Stripper, and we now know how those tuition bills got paid. <laughs> now, Heidi, wait a minute. You are the most wholesome-looking woman I think I've seen in uh, 15 minutes since I come up from UCLA. What is this stripping deal here? It's great money. It's smart business. Is it? For some people, yes. If you have the right personality, it's an incredible It didn't way. bother you at all to uh, go out there and have all these guys leering at you? No, I thought it was exceptionally stupid and strange, unusual, but I didn't feel it was wrong. You felt that you were being stupid? Or? No, no, no. The, the situation is stupid. Okay. All of these leering men, as you called them. And you were taking off your clothes and it's... they were throwing money at you like crazy and yeah. then you were giving it to Brown. Yes. Yeah, that's how it went. What did your mom say? Ooh, I didn't tell my mother for a couple of years. Um, I didn't think that it was going to be a big deal. I didn't think I was going to write a book about it. It was just a, a quick fix, right? Well, it turned into something I was actually proud of and happy about. And when I finally told her, she was very, very upset. She I felt bet. she'd failed as a mother, and I had no work ethic, which I was raised to believe was the most important thing. And so she said to you, you don't have any work ethic. Yeah, and I never want to speak to you or about your book ever again. Because wow. she knew I was writing a book. She yeah. knew I had publishers in New York calling me back, and she was bragging to her friends. Well, I'm that not surprised. In Maine, you know, that's how people, you know, <laughs> yes, not I know. L.A. out there in Maine. I know. You know? I, and she had been bragging that I was writing the great American novel. So, of course, when I told her what the book was about, she was upset. So, but, the, so we can uh, call from that that the Ivy League stripper isn't the great American novel, right? We're, it's an autobiography. It's okay. a coming of age story. Have you made up with your mom now? Absolutely. Yes, okay, she came good. around in two weeks. All right. She oh, really, in two weeks she yes. came around. But I bet she never came into the show, did she? She has come into the club. She has seen you in the little whatever, you She's know. seen me on videotape and I uh -huh. escorted her through the club and showed her other girls dancing. Right. Yeah. Um, because I don't want to condone what you do, I mean, mm -hmm. to me it's, it's not important, but what kind of individual should not do what you did? Because a lot of these women get severely you know, in trouble psychologically. Absolutely, I agree. The, the dangers are psychological, and they are many, and I don't recommend this job. I don't recommend what I've done. But I cannot deny that I had a great experience. I had fun. I made a lot of money, and I'm not sorry, but I'm a particular personality, and it agreed with me. Are you an exhibitionist? No, not so much an exhibitionist, but I'm very pragmatic. I'm very disciplined. Um, I have a really strong sense of boundaries, and I know what I wanted. What I wanted was graduation and to pay my bills, and that's what I did. And that's what happened. So you're not you're not doing this anymore. You're writing now. And I write full time. NBC is going to make this movie, and mm -hmm. it'll probably play in the Family Hour. I bet, uh, won't it? <laughs> you um, never know. Who do you want to play you as the Ivy League stripper? Oh, uh, who would I like? Yeah, um, not Demi Moore. She tried it. No, it no, didn't no. work. Okay. No, uh, Laura Layton from Melrose Place is is fun. Okay, well, we'll give blonde. Laura a call. Now, two quick questions. <laughs> sure. Amy Carter was in your class at Brown. Yes. And they threw her out. Yes. <laughs> Poor Amy, what did you get thrown out for? Uh, not attending enough classes. She was, she she was busy an being an activist. Okay. Yeah. And what did you get your degree in? English and American literature. Well, that's, uh, that means that the uh, Ivy League stripper should be very well written. You mm -hmm. have English and American literature. Yes. Thanks, Heidi, for coming in here. Thank you. Quite a story. Thank you. And the whole, most wholesome looking woman in the world. I'm sure you see that. <laughs> and directly ahead, we'll sock it to Dick Martin, the star of one of the most successful programs in television history. We'll be here to have that report right after these messages.
In news, a picture is worth a thousand words. At Fox News Channel, two words give you the whole picture. Fair and balanced. For fair news, Fox News Channel. We report, you decide. Tonight, we're going to look at the Battle of the Sexes. Oh, wish I'd have got tickets for that. Who won? We're going to look at man and woman. Uh, I know which one I'm going to look at. All right, he said earnestly, uh, tell me, how do you look at women? Oh, sometimes like this, sometimes like that. <laughs> From 1968 to 1973, Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In broke all the rules and became one of America's most successful television programs. It also changed the way comedy was presented on television. Dan Rowan, Dick Martin, and their cast, including Goldie Hawn and Lily Tomlin, made fun of everything. Richard Nixon even appeared on the program. The censors at NBC didn't much like it, but Americans did, and we still remember. Dick Martin joins us now. Mm -hmm. That was really a defining program. First of all, it was in a time of tremendous change in the United well, States. Well, the 60s were... Right. Very, very... So you didn't have any shortage of material. Oh, no. Oh, dear me. But you and the Smothers Brothers were the first ones to really thumb your nose at the establishment like that's, crazy. That's true. Nobody did it before. Uh, uh, you know, Bob Hope would... Uh, but he was gentle and uh, uh, talked about uh, uh, politics. Will Rogers, of course, was marvelous. But nobody went, uh, boom. Subversive humor. <laughs> nobody really took apart really, the establishment. No, no. How difficult was it to get the stuff by the NBC censors who were standing there on a set? Well, we were the first to ever have a uh, live-in censor. See, up until then, standards and practice was a, a place uh, with an office up there somewhere. And uh, the shows would send them the script. They would put the blue pencil where they thought things were uh, in error and then send them back to you, and you'd make that correction and do the show. Right. Well, that didn't work with us. <laughs> right. You were doing pretty much what you wanted to do. Yeah. Now, you had a reference to marijuana that you snuck by the censors. Seven of them on the first show. On the first yes, show? Yes, we had one where they said, uh, uh, Boris is so dumb, uh, he thinks Tupperware is uh, a little pot for midgets. And they said, you can't do that. And they said, why? Well, Tupperware's a plug. <laughs> they didn't know it was They had no, no idea that pot was yes, a slang no. for marijuana. We had, uh, for the first time in years, everyone at the UN has agreed on every issue. And they're still looking for the person who put the grass in the air conditioner. Mm -hmm. uh, and they said, what's funny about that? Well, you see, when we had to make up stories, you know. People mow the lawn and then throw the grass in, and it's funny. So know? actually, you lied to the censors. Oh, 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 oh. You know, and, and, Repeatedly. So, and they didn't get the joke, and they let it go. Now, Dan Rowan, your partner, passed away in 1987. Yeah. You guys were a great team. Yeah. And before laughing, you were on Ed Sullivan. I remember seeing you as a oh, little yeah. kid yeah. Uh, doing the circuit. Um, but the, the cast that you put together, Goldie Hawn, for example, nobody had ever heard of her. No, uh, we got her off a show called... Uh, um, uh, love. She was playing that. Ronnie Shell's girlfriend on a show that didn't go, I don't think, 13 weeks. But she was adorable. And you, it was it you who picked her or the producers? We, there were five people who picked did all, uh, everybody. Because the cast was brilliant. I mean, you yeah. had, you had uh, Goldie, Lily Tomlin. Lily, uh, yes. Joanne uh, Worley, yep. Henry Gibson. They were in a, a lot of them were in a Billy Barnes Review. If you remember, Billy Barnes did all the music for um, uh, Laugh-In, uh, other than the, uh, the musical conductor was Ian Bernard. But he did all the uh, songs. Mm -hmm. So they had a thing out here called uh, uh, Billy Barnes Review. Uh, Alan Seuss was in it, Joanne Worley, Ruth Buzzy. So uh, that's what we You just plucked them out. Yeah. Now that ensemble um, probably paved the way for Saturday Night Live. Well, Lauren think. Michaels was uh, on our show the last two years. Right. And you know, I, and I, and I, I want to get your reaction to this. We have a minute left. But you know who else that you influenced? Mm. Howard Stern. Did you ever uh, think about that? I guess so. Come to think because of his subversive humor and so. anti-establishment yeah. bent has made him a humongous star and an incredible amount of money. I guess so. Now, do you like that kind of humor? What I've he never does? heard him. 
Really? Yeah, well, I don't. He's on at six o'clock in the morning, and, and, and I'm either sleeping or or sleeping. Or on the, the golf course, yeah. or something like that. You should listen to him. I, I would love I to should. know what you would think. I will one day. Because never... we just heard Phyllis Diller said she doesn't like the dirty stuff, you know, the stand up and this and that. But I've never seen it, so right. I don't know. When we come back, I want to talk to you about uh, your directing and Newhart and, uh, and uh, all the guys that Americans just uh, remember forever. And we'll be back with more with Dick Martin in just a moment from now. Have you noticed that it's warmer in the country than it is in the summer?